I want to say that Johnson & Johnson is a family brand. And the American people have come to rely on that for more than 100 years. Until recently, most people would not think twice about giving their child one of your products. In fact, most Americans have at least one or more of your products in their home. But I have become deeply concerned about your company. The information I've seen during the course of our investigation raises questions about the integrity of the company. It paints a picture of a company that is deceptive, dishonest, and has, and has risked the health of many of our children. As the ranking member, Mr. Issa, said earlier in his opening statement, I hope that you will be forthcoming today about your company. And on that note, let me just go to a couple questions. Is it true that excess amount of certain active ingredients were found in your children's medicines? Um, Chairman Towns, it is true that lots of the product were produced with excess amounts of the medicines, but these never reached the marketplace. In fact, as I think Ms. Otter said earlier this morning, we produced um, something like 10 or 11 lots of product. Three were rejected on that grounds. The other seven were tested, and I should say we test all of our finished products extensively. We take samples from the beginning, the middle, and the end of manufacturing, and we make sure they're within the specification. They were. We released them to the marketplace. When the FDA raised its concerns, we tested the last batch, which we had in our possession. We actually tested 1,200 bottles, and not one of the 1,200 bottles was over the specified amount of active ingredient. So was that a yes or no? I'm sorry. Um, that, is, that is that no product with excess acetaminophen entered the marketplace to the best of our knowledge in testing. But it was actually found in the medicine, so that would be a yes. It was found, but it was rejected, sir. It never reached the marketplace. Would you agree that these quality control issues are totally unacceptable? I would absolutely agree with that, yes, sir. Did you have contractors go back to stores and buy medicine instead of recalling the medicine? No, we did. Let me explain that, sir. I think it's very important. There's a lot of misinformation about the entirety of this recall, and I'm glad you raised that issue right now because I think there's misperceptions. We did have a, a Motrin dissolution issue in 2009. We dis it was on a small product that was distributed in gasoline stations. We discussed with the San Juan District of the FDA um, this issue. We just talked to them about hiring a third-party contractor to go to see the breadth of the distribution of these products. So we were in discussions with them. They knew that we'd hired this third party, and the third party did go out to make an inventory, and we discussed that with the San Juan office of the FDA. So there was never any intent to mislead or hide anything from anyone. So the San Juan office of the FDA were aware of the fact that you were going out to uh, purchase? That is correct, sir. We were in discussions with them. Let me make sure that I understand. Now, you went out and you purchased them, but the FDA was aware of the fact that you were going to do it? Let me, let me see if I can explain what happened. Yeah, help we, me. Yeah. We had um, a Motrin product where the dissolution profile, or how it's solubilized, wasn't in specification. So it was sold, it's a small product that's sold primarily in gas stations. We discussed this issue with the San Juan office of the FDA, and we agreed or we offered to have a contract force go out and identify how much of this was in the marketplace. The FDA was aware that we were doing that in San Juan, and we did that. I can't tell you about the behavior of these contractors in the market or what the said or didn't say or how they acted, but clearly the FDA was aware of this, and um, there was no intent, obviously, to mislead or hide anything. In other words, to tell us, for the contractors to go in and say, uh, uh, do not mentioned the fact that this is a recall. You know nothing about any of that. I know nothing about that, sir. I know only that we were in discussions with the FDA in San Juan over the product issue and how we were planning to handle it with a third-party co third contractor. Yeah. Do you have any 
some kind of documents or anything that might be able to confirm what you're saying? Because, you know, I just find it, you know, um, in terms of the fact that FDA is saying that they learned of this and uh, later on, if you're in discussions with them, you know, why wouldn't they know it immediately? Chairman Towns, I can't answer that question. What I can do is I can promise you to get back to you with the kind of documentation what we have to, uh, regarding this issue. In fact, I'd welcome the opportunity. Yeah, well, I would like for you to do that for me because happy to. I just find this very, very disturbing, in fact, that, um, that they went in to, to purchase these, the products. FDA is saying they had no knowledge of it, and of course... Uh, um, no more disturbing than I do, sir. Right. How can this happen in a company of your size and reputation? I mean, how could this, something like this happen? Your, your company's had a long-standing reputation, you, you know, and, uh, you know, that's a question we've been asking ourselves, and what I can tell you is that we think it comes down to a number of factors. It comes down to people and leadership and processes. And what I can tell you is that um, we've made significant changes in the leadership. We've actually changed six key executive positions. We've changed the head of OTC uh, manufacturing. We've changed the head of OTC quality. We've changed the head of uh, the plant at McNeil, uh, excuse me, at Fort Washington. We've changed the head of quality at Fort Washington. We've changed the head of quality at our Puerto Rico plant. We've changed the head of manufacturing, and we've re reassigned people at other levels. So, um, so all your quality issues have now been solved? Oh, I would not say that, sir. What I would say in addition is that we've taken, undertaken a broad assessment of all of our OTC plants. We've engaged a, a third-party contractor, um, third, excuse me, third-party expert to take a look at our plants and help us do this assessment. And we've committed to the FDA that by July 15th, we'll have a master plan regarding the remediation of all of our plants as necessary. Right. Thank you. And now you have five minutes to the gentleman from California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since you patiently sat through the first hearing, you're, uh, you're aware of my line of questioning, so I'm going to sort of follow up, mm -hmm. uh, sort of FDA you. Sure. You told me that uh, in the, your testimony and in the chairman's questions, you said basically there was no safety issue in relation to the product that got out of the plant, period. Not the product that may have had been multiple times its effective uh, or advertised dosage that remained in the plant as defective material, but the product that got out of the plant as of right now science both at the FDA and you considered that there was no health risk from that product. Is that correct? Yes, the FDA and Johnson & Johnson and McNeil's aligned that the risk of a serious health event is remote and to date there have been no serious health events associated okay. with any of the reasons for the recall. Okay, so the recall was more about <clears throat> failure to live up to your own standards and therefore a recall not uh, and, and, of course, the potential that if you didn't live up to your own standards, something bad could happen. But the actual product being recalled is not dangerous to the consumer. That is correct. Now, in the case of, uh, and ma'am, you're, you're very good and scientific. If I understood what you said about the, uh, the Advil product, uh, or Mo the, the gasoline station. Motrin. Motrin. Yes, Motrin. Wrong brand. The Motrin. What you've got is paper two-packs that they sell at gas stations. And if you take these, you're not getting much use out of them because they don't dissolve properly. Is That's that correct. right? That is correct, yes. So in plain English, they simply wouldn't cure your headache, but they wouldn't hurt you. It would take longer to cure your headache, yes, and it would, they would not hurt you, though. No, okay, so it's not going to hurt you, just not going to be correct. as good as advertised. And you hired a contractor to try to do it, and you did inform, you've said under oath, you did inform the FDA, at least at their local yes. level. Uh, <clears throat> I was a manufacturer for 20 years. Uh, under ISO 9001, if you find a defect, you do two things. You segregate the defects and, of course, you go through a quality analysis to try to keep that from happening again. Right. In the case of the uh, Fort Washington facility, if that was where these products were produced that were multiple times their, their normal dosage, or was it Puerto Rico? I, I didn't that was Fort Washington, Fort sir. Washington. You segregated the product, is that correct? We did. You destroyed the product. I believe so. And what steps were taken to prevent this from reoccurring? Um, that you, if you know. Yes, I don't. I believe I don't. I honestly don't know the answer to that. What I can tell you is that we had a rigorous testing program um, to ensure that um, 
the products were within specification before they hit the marketplace. And we did go back and we took a look at the last lot that we had in our possession, did extensive testing, 1,200 bottles. Um, I don't know that we, I can't answer right now about what we did or didn't to go back to test the root cause. Now, some months ago, we think famously, but we're in Washington, so our image of what's famous may not be, but we had Akio Toyota sitting where you're sitting. He made commitments to us that he would use dramatic resources on a scale not seen before to change his company mm -hmm. to be the leader, not the follower, ahead of, not behind in quality. Can you make that same commitment today on behalf of Johnson & Johnson? Yes, I can, and I think I can give you some points that indicate that we're Please. on the road to doing that. Um, as I mentioned, we've changed a number of key personnel, both in quality and in our manufacturing organization. Um, we have contracted with an outside expert with pharmaceutical experience to help take a look at our plants independently and determine what needs to be done. We've undertaken on our own a, an assessment of all of our plants across our North American OTC network. We've made some changes already and I think perhaps most importantly we've committed to the FDA that we'll have a comprehensive plan that we'll share with them on, by July 15th. Excellent answer. I, I, I hope you live up to it. I uh, expect after a hundred years of your company good reputation that you have a reason to. Let me follow up with sort of a final line. Uh, <clears throat> again, I said I was a manufacturer. I'm not bragging or complaining. But before I could sell to General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, and others, I had to pass independent uh, QS and ISO uh, analysis. And they came back in regularly. So in, in addition to my own quality folks, in addition to the auto companies and other companies I supplied to over the years, we had ongoing annual and quarterly independent evaluation. Is there a similar situation or is there a similar capability within your industry and do you employ it? I think there are, I think there are two ways that we can do that, sir. One is that we can employ uh, the corporate quality resources at Johnson & Johnson and in fact we've brought a lot of those to bear in the current situation and they take an independent look at our processes at McNeil. And the second thing is I, I mentioned we have um, engaged a third party expert in manufacturing of pharmaceuticals, manufacturing processes and sites, and we've engaged them to help us take a look at our plants comprehensively. Well, in closing, I, uh, I would say that public confidence would be increased, and I hope that you will consider a level of transparency of these independent reviews, and uh, if at all possible, that that independent review be ongoing for a period of time. I, for one, uh, applauded the FDA uh, for being diligent in this case. Uh, as you can imagine, I'm much more concerned about the fact that you test your products three times as to potency and what's in it. Well, in fact, the FDA does not test even once products coming in by the container load from countries and facilities they have no ability to test. So, Mr. Chairman, I hope that as we follow up in this process, that latter will be included in our question of is our food and, and drug safe under the current law if they're imported. I yield back. Right. Thank you, gentlemen, for his uh, questions. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. I'd ask the uh, staff to put the first exhibit up. <clears throat> Ms. Goggins, uh, you've testified that uh, no raw materials that tested positive for objectionable bacteria were ever used in the manufacture of McNeil's pediatric products. Now, uh, an FDA a document which I have a copy of here states McNeil's lab determined the presence of B. sapatia in Avacil raw material to be objectionable placing the target population at risk if the contaminant was in the product. The product is for use in infants and children. However, the firm knowingly the firm knowingly proceeded to re partially release some of the remaining raw material, Avacil, which was used to manufacture more product. What's your response? My response is that that is, that, that is untrue. Um, what I would tell you is that... What's untrue? Your testimony or we, this document from the FDA? My testimony is not, in, is not incorrect, so let me clarify the issue for you. This is one of the issues that has been in the media and is simply incorrect. It is true that we tested one incoming um, lot of, Avis, of Avacil, which is an inactive ingredient in our children's products. It tested positive for an objectionable bacteria. We rejected it. 
We test each of our incoming raw materials. We've tested them all extensively. Um, we have never used, when they, we've never used a product that tests positive or objectionable bacteria in our manufacturing process. Further, when our products are manufactured, we test them after manufacturing for the presence of, of harmful bacteria. We've also have preservative systems and other capabilities in our formulas, which would, if a bacteria was in our product, preclude the growth of that bacteria. Um, we also then, given the FDA's concerns on this issue, went back, we tested retained products of these, of these uh, products in question. None of them tested positive for this bacteria. We then went back and we tested the preservative systems by inoculating them with bacteria, and the preservative systems killed all the bacteria. So I feel very confident in saying that we did not knowingly use the we did not knowingly use Thank products you. with bacteria, and we did not release them into the marketplace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This memo also states at the end of inspection, an FDA 483 was issued for deficiencies, including failure to reject Avacil raw material after learning of Bisopatia contamination of raw material Avacil. Then it gives the the lot number. I submit this for the record. Uh, that staff put up, so Staff put up the second exhibit. Uh, a six-year-old boy took medication that was manufactured at your plants in Fort Washington and Puerto Rico. Uh, he died this year. He tested positive for uh, B. Cepatia. I have a report here, which is a McNeil Consumer and Specialty Pharmaceuticals uh, in-house document dated May 10, 2010, uh, where they state that the child was taking medications that were manufactured at Las Piedras plant and Fort Washington plant. Uh, that uh, you, you apparently were in touch with the coroner who mentioned the child was sick for nausea and vomiting, goes on to give other details, say the child's sputum was tested positive for the B. Cepatia, uh, uh complex that is the subject of this. Do you have any knowledge of that? Yes, I do, sir. And what's your response? My response is the same as Dr. Sharfstein, sir, in that we take every adverse medical event seriously. We investigate this. We did discuss this with the coroner. Um, the products, as Dr. Sharfstein said this morning, tested negative for the presence of Bisopatia. And in fact, the products that the young child was administered were not even in the investigation of the Bisopatia issue. Are, are you aware that the, uh, that the Food and Drug Administration uh, official also testified that a coroner's report has not yet been returned on that? Number yes. three, I'd like the third uh, exhibit put up. Another six-year-old boy with cystic fibrosis took Tylenol and tested positive for B. Cepatia. As I'm sure you know, children with cystic fibrosis are particularly susceptible to B. Cepatia, according to the uh, CDC. And this is a, uh, also, I want to submit this to the record without objection, establishment inspection report, McNeil Consumer Health Division, uh, where it confirms that a, uh, a, a six-year-old child tested positive for uh, a form of B. Cepatia, and uh, uh, it says during the inspection another complaint was received by the FDA. No details were given except there was a death of a baby in reference to the use of concentrated Tylenol infants drops. Uh, this goes to the record. Now, Ms. Goggins, can you tell the American people what they should think when they learn that the FDA found that McNeil knowingly led contaminated raw material into children's medicine and that a contaminant was found in at least two children, one of whom died? As I said, Congressman, we never used contaminated raw materials in the manufacturing of McNeil pediatric products. Mr. Chairman, that's at variance with a document that we, we got uh, from, the, from the FDA, and I think this sub the committee ought to take further note of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I can thank the gentleman for his questions. And of course, um, uh, we have not made a decision as to what we're going to do from this point on. I now yield to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Chairman, I would yield to the general lady from, from Washington. General lady from Washington, D.C., Ms. Norton is recognized <coughs> for five minutes. Uh, I thank the gentleman for, for yielding. Um, I am concerned, uh, Ms. Goggins, about the, the, the delay here. I can understand that there could be difficulties in manufacturing, but I believe you need to clarify for the public why delay doesn't give the appearance of cover-up. The FDA, as you know, found that, and I'm using their words now, that, um, that your investigation or McNeil's investigation unjustifiably delayed uh, and terminated prematurely. Now, that's what concerns me because apparently the, the, the complaints began with 
an uncharacteristic bad odor. Now I can see given the symptoms that were reported and we understand those to have been nausea and vomiting and diarrhea and you're talking about children, I can tell you somebody who had kids, they all do that anyway. I can understand you're thinking that could have had any number of causes. What I don't understand is why any manufacturer hearing, uh, if you will forgive me, that its product stunk <laughs> wouldn't immediately see that as a justification for investigation. Yet, I understand it took a hundred complaints uh, and that you did not discover the contamination until September 2009, although this bad odor began in April 2008. Why did it take you so long, particularly given the bad odor, which seems to me should have been enough, yes, to, let me, let me to find what was the root cause of, of this uh, contamination? Yes, you're referring to the recall um, that we executed between November and January regarding the contamination of our products with TBA. Um, we did receive a number of complaints uh, uh, regarding these products and manufactured in our Las Piedras, Puerto Rico facility. The complaints were characterized by the consumers as a moldy and musty odor. We did, we did engage in an investigation of microbiology because when we get a complaint of uh, musty, moldy, we assume that it's a micro issue. Um, there was no evidence of any kind of a micro issue. Si for six months, we then received no complaints whatsoever, and we thought the issue had gone away. And then um, in April, I believe, of 2009, the, uh, the complaints came back, and that's when we realized that um, we needed to deepen our investigation. What I guess I would say about this is that this is a very, this is a very unusual compound. It's not well ca characterized. It's not well known. It's not been found in the industry. Well, did it, did it ever have a bad odor before? Is it that uh, unusual? Not due to this, uh, not due to this contaminant, ma'am, no. This is the first. Um, so if I can just, if I can just, yes. if I can just continue, please. So we found that um, there's only, there was only one lab in the country that we were able to locate that could identify what this was, and there were only two experts in the world that we could identify, one in California and one in France, to characterize this. We finally found what the product was when we did. Um, in January, we recalled a quite extensive amount of product, about 565 lots of product, and I think we did out of an abundance of caution. I would add that there's been no adverse medical events due to the trace <clears throat> levels of this contaminant. Yeah, after the fact, we're grateful. Um, but of course, the FDA's concern was in the delay here. We don't know what, what this might have, have done had it been something more serious, uh, particularly since the regu regulations require drug, drug manufacturers uh, to submit field reports within three days of receipt of information of uh, contamination, bacteria and contamination of some kind, uh, or for that matter of any change or deterioration in, in a drug product. Um, apparently, McNeil began receiving complaints in 2008, but you did not follow this three-day uh, three requirement and did not alert the FDA, FDA. <coughs> um, why didn't you share this information immediately with the, uh, with the FDA? Indeed, after you had results confirming contamination, you didn't share those results immediately with the, with the, uh, with the FDA. You know, I must say, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not certain of the chronology of these events, but what I can tell you is that you began I receiving consumer complaints in 2008. You did not, uh, and this is why FDA found unjustifiable delay and termination prematurely. You began receiving them in 2008. The regulations require you to report within three days of receipt of any, any information regarding bacterial con contamination. Did you believe that you had to have them confirmed in some kind of way before you alerted FDA? I can't tell you when we did or did not alert FDA. What I can tell you is that we did undertake a micro investigation of it, and it was found not to have any micro contamination. Other than that, I can't tell you about the chronology. Again, I want you to know, Ms. Goggins, the concern here from the point of view of the consumer I understand. is delay. Uh, it, it, transparency helps a great deal to ward off the notion of cover-up. 
And FDA finds unjustifiable delay and, and premature termination of complaints. You say, yes, but we, we essentially waited to see if it would come back. And when it came back, we decided to do it again. That is very troubling. Seems to me once you have 100 complaints about a bad order and something you're telling to the public, uh, you ought to want to tell the FDA immediately and you ought to want to do something very quickly. It didn't happen very quickly if we're going from April 2008 to September 2009. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentleman. Woman from, from Washington, D.C. I know you have five minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Coggins, um, tell me, um, when did you learn that there were serious problems at McNeil. When, when did you first learn that? I mean, I think we became aware, sir, that there were is quality issues uh, probably in the first half of 2009. Okay. And according to our investigation, you made uh, you all had a major shakeup of McNeil management. I think you've already testified to that. Is that correct? Uh, we did replace a number of key uh, quality and manufacturing individuals. Yes, sir. And can you tell me what went into that decision? What, how, why did, uh, first of all, who made the decision? Um, it was, I was part of that decision, sir, and uh -huh. there were other people who were involved as well, but I was part of that decision. Uh -huh. And what was that, why did you make that, what was that decision? How did you come to the conclusion that you had to shake up the management? I think the fact that we uh, were not happy with our quality processes based on some of the things that we saw, both in terms of recalls and in terms of some of the FDA, um, the FDA uh, observations that we got in a Form 483, and I think we were also concerned about some of the uh, the issues that have been raised here today. And you, you understand, um, you know, it's, it's one thing, I was, when um, Mr. Sharpstein, Dr. Sharpstein was testifying, I was trying to get a clarification. You know, it's one thing if you go to McDonald's and you get a sandwich and it has a worm in it, God forbid, and then McDonald's says, you know what, it's no big deal can't do you any harm. That's one standard. And, but the standard is it should never have been a worm in the, in the sandwich. I know that's a little extreme for those people who haven't eaten their lunch, but. <laughs> but what I'm saying to you is that I'm wondering if there's a difference in the standard. First of all, it sounds like McNeil didn't even adhere to its own standard, let alone FDA's. Would you agree? Um, I would say, sir, that we are, um, I think we have, there are a number, we have a very high standard because I think consumers expect a lot of us and I think we did not adhere to that high standard on a quality, on the quality standpoint. That's why we enacted this broad recall. And can we put a pen in that right now, right where you are right there? And should consumers expect the, the high standard? They should, sir, and our intention is to remediate our plants to the highest possible standards. Now, Ms. Goggins, can Johnson & Johnson tell the American people today with complete certainty that no children who took these recalled medicines were harmed by them? You know, what I can do is reiterate what Dr. Sharfstein said this morning, that we um, don't believe that there, the, we believe that the risk of a serious medical event is remote, and there have been no serious medical events associated with the reasons for the recall of these products. Now, you said that you all had some concerns and you heard Dr. Sharfstein's testimony. It sounds like he had some concerns uh, with regard to the way things were going along. And it's one thing if it's one instance, but there's another thing when there's a, it appears to be a pattern of these things. Is that one of the things that concerns you? Um, I think the number more than the pattern, sir, there were a different number of plants and different number of products and different number of medicines involved and different number of issues, but the number concerned me, yes. And what were the top three issues that went into your decision to bring in new management? Just curious. Well, as I said, I think that the... Uh, Give me the, the top three. The top three. And the so the public can hear what, what, what went on when you all decided to make this change so that hopefully they can have some confidence when they buy these uh, products? I think it was the number of quality issues we had, the quality issues themselves, and the fact that um, the FDA had made observations that we were very disappointed in. Now, would you agree that government has a role in, in, in uh, making sure that products that end up uh, in the medicine cabinets of the public uh, are safe? I would, like most Americans, I have a great deal of respect for the FDA. 
I think they have an important mission, an important operation, and they've been very professional in their dealings with us. So yes, I agree with you. Now, a little bit earlier, there was a uh, statement uh, by one of the witnesses from the FDA that this matter had been referred uh, for possible criminal uh, prosecution. Did you hear that? I did, yes. And w w are you concerned about that? Sir, my major concern right now is remediating our plants to the highest possible level of quality and getting products back on the marketplace for the consumers who need them. And the Fort Washington plant, that's basically closed down right now? It is closed down right now, yes. And when do you expect that to reopen? I don't know, sir. Um, what I can tell you is that we will not reopen that plant until we meet our own and the public's and the FDA standards for high quality and safety. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, gentleman from Maryland. Uh, yeah, I want to just, Ms. Goggin, go back to this contractor business. Now, the contractors, what were they contracted to do and who contracted them? Explain all this to me because it's just not clear to me. I can tell you what I know and then I promise you I'll come back to you with more information. Um, the product in question is sparsely, sparsely distributed, as I understand it, primarily in gas stations. So I think the idea was to go in and identify how much product there was on the shelves. But beyond that, I don't know, sir. We did contract them, but as I said, I'm told that we contracted them in discussions and with the knowledge of the San Juan office of the FDA. So I guess what I'm saying, were they instructed to go out and buy, you know, if they found? Uh, I can't answer that, sir, nor can, I, nor can I answer the question of what their alleged to have said. I don't know the answers to that. I'd like for you to get back to us on because these contractors, I mean, you know, I, I just find this very disturbing, you know. Um, As do I. Yeah. Okay. So, um, in other words, you do not know who actually contracted them or what their role and responsibility uh, uh, was. You don't know any of that, those kind of I know questions. only that I imagine we contracted them, sir, and we did so, as I'm told, with the knowledge of the FDA. Mm -hmm. Were they instructed to do certain things? Uh, I can't, I can't tell you right now what they were instructed to do or not, sir. You know, uh, the quality control, do you have the same amount of people in the quality control unit today as you had four years ago, three years ago, I mean, uh, or eight years ago? I believe What's the situation with quality control? Yeah, I believe that at the Fort Washington plant, our head count is basically flat. I do know that between 2006 and 2009, we increased our spending 17 percent, and I know that we've increased it again this year. This document that was actually just brought to my attention says this, you should simply act like a regular customer while making these purchases. There must, must be no mention of this being a recall of the product. If asked, simply state that your employer is checking the distribution chain of this product and needs to have some of it purchased for the project is a demonstration project and we want to purchase some for the demonstration project. Is this accurate? As I said, sir, I have no idea. What I can tell you is that um, I have no idea of, of whether or not that was, is true or not and I also have no idea of the context, sir. I have no idea. All I know is that we, contract, we did hire a third party contractor and I do know that we did it with discussions with the FDA and they were aware of it. But let me put it this way. If this is true, does it bother you? Um, again, I don't know the context, sir. I, if, if, thank you. I don't know the context. I'd have to understand the context. I don't believe there was any intent to mislead or hide anything, so I don't know the answer to that. So I can't answer that. You know, I'm really trying to finish this, but I tell you, there's just some unanswered questions here that just are very troubling. On that note, I yield to the ranking member, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, First of all, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to uh, ask additional questions, supplement, or provide information. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Uh, this email, I think, speaks for itself. 
uh, what we don't have here is we don't have the individuals behind that. Uh, can I ask that you use your authority to investigate the email? We'll certainly give you a copy if you don't have it. And get back to us in detail with either the individual and statements that they would make for us subject to our interrogatories if we choose, uh, and at least their side of the story. Because on the face of it all, I look at this and it appears as though people acting on your behalf, uh, working for one of your subsidiaries, did ask for this information. And we'd, be, we'd appreciate knowing for sure the individual, assuming they're still working with you. If they're not, then provide us the information and we'll contact them directly. Uh, my understanding uh, from our investigators is that there was a cutback, not on your watch, but at this facility in 2006, a reshuffling of where uh, quality personnel uh, were located. Do you know anything about that? Uh, no, I do not. What I can tell you is what I referenced earlier, that in fact the headcount is flat um, from 2006 till now, and in fact spending up, was up 17% 2006 to 2009, and it's up again this year. Okay. Uh, I guess uh, there were a lot of questions about, about deaths of, uh, I heard a number as high as 37. To date, are you involved in any litigation in which you're the defendant where someone is alleging that your products, those 37 if you will, your Tylenol series products are, have led to the death or severe injury of some uh, child? You know, not to my knowledge, but let me just say that I would ne necessarily know that, and I'd ask you if we could get back to you if we talk to our legal group. I would appreciate it if you'd respond in writing. I guess lastly, uh, you use imported products like all companies at times, is that correct? I believe we do, yes. Uh, my understanding is the source of the smelly pallets could well have been imported wood. Uh, is that correct? Or we at least not mainland U.S.? We believe that um, our packaging, our supplier of packaging components did use wood from Latin America that was treated with this ingredient, yes. Okay, so I just want you to run us through. Uh, I've dealt with import and production from all over the world and in all of, uh, other parts of the world. What did you do after this extensive research, finding only two people in the world that could do it, but you got to the fact that you had a problem. What did you do relative to the vendor uh, for the future? In other words, what corrective action was in your quality loop relative to not having this happen again? Uh, one thing, the main thing we did, sir, was that um, not just for the McNeil organization, but for Johnson & Johnson in total, we mandated that we would only use uh, material that came in on heat-treated wooden pallets, which precludes the use of this fungicide, mm -hmm. or plastic pallets where you don't use it at all. Okay, and, and I guess last, uh, presently the federal government uh, has had a series of problems here in the U.S., more of them related to the vitamin industry of imported vitamins from outside the U.S., but some related to uh, non-prescription drugs. If you were sourcing vitamins, ingestible products, non-prescription drugs from completely outside of your own production, outside of the U.S. and outside of factories you control, how often would you test them and how often would you visit the facilities and what level of transparency would you require in order to bring that product to the American people? You know, I, what I can do is perhaps um, draw an analogy to what we do now with raw materials and I imagine our standards would be exactly the same. We require all of our suppliers to give us a certificate saying that they've tested the product and it meets the specification which required from them. That being said, when the products arrive at our own facilities, we retest them for identity, for potency, for, you know, for microbial contamination. Um, and then when we use them in the raw final goods, excuse me, we do test them again. Well, and I would we appreciate that. And, and although I, I, we don't make it a practice to look at any one private company when we write legislation, this committee is very interested in the question of drug and food safety. And as imports increase, uh, both raw materials that you may be checking, but finished product that come in uh, from overseas complete and in the container, it, is, it became apparent in the earlier FDA portion that it is not tested to that level, that the, uh, the inspection of your facilities uh, seven times in five years does not occur in an aspirin factory in China. 
So uh, I would appreciate the input you could give as we begin looking at how we should instruct the FDA and other agencies to inspect similar products coming in from around the world where we have no such luxury as to send inspectors seven times in five years. We'd be happy to provide that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman from Maryland. Thank you very much. For five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I won't even take five minutes. Um, I understand that you are you basically uh, retraining folks. Is, are you, is that retraining completed or is that ongoing? No, it's ongoing. We have a large, we will be undertaking, we've already started to undertake uh, training programs. Uh -huh. And how do you, what kind of things are you emphasizing in this retraining? Um, we're I'm emphasizing a, a commitment to quality. We're emphasizing um, adherence to good general manufacturing, good manufacturing practices, um, and a number of other things. I would say that our program definition isn't complete yet, and one of the things we're doing with the third-party experts we've hired, the independent experts, is we're putting together a comprehensive plan, which we'll share with the FDA on July 15th. Now, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a chairman of the committee on the Coast Guard, and one of the things that they do in the Coast Guard is whenever they have a, uh, a problem, they take that problem and they use it as a learning tool. Uh, is that part of this process? Um, it could well be, sir. It's a good idea. Yeah, it's, it's helpful that way because, again, if you're talking about having, and I noticed that you ended your testimony uh, saying that you wanted, you all wanted to make sure you earned the trust of the public, it seems to me that if there's a training process that in order for it to be effective, not only effective with regard to changes in, within the corporation, but also effective with regard to the public having confidence, seems as if you would have to almost certainly uh, show these new folks or whoever the old folks, whoever's there, whoever you're training, uh, what has happened and how those things should not happen again. So I would make that very, very strong suggestion. I just want to go back. I'm, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm curious. As, uh, I wish I could have been a fly in the room when you fired all these people. How many people did you all fire? You know, I can't give you the exact number of people who are no longer in their position. But you were there, weren't you? I was not there, no, sir. Oh, I thought you no, just sir. told me you were in the meeting. No, no, I was, I was, uh, I was involved in the decision to uh, fire these people. I was oh, not you, there myself. Oh, 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 so you just, you weren't, <laughs> you weren't in the room. You helped to give the order. I, d I was part of the discussion, yes, sir. Okay, all right. I'm sorry. I didn't, so, but were a number of people dismissed? Um, the, we have new, yes, we, we, have, we have a number of new people in the most senior positions in both our quality and our manufacturing organizations. And are they, do you know whether a lot of these people are from in-house or a lot of them out-house? No, the they, were all, they were all our employees, sir. They were already employees? They were all our employees. And so you all, is that the, your normal procedure when you have a, have a problem, you, you bring people from within and not anybody from outside? No, we, we do both. Or we have people both, um, we hire people both inside and outside in different jobs depending on the qualifications. And then we also will bring fresh pairs of eyes in as we have done in this case with an independent third party consultant. And just one last thing, I'd ask you about the Fort Washington uh, plant. What are you all doing now to try to reopen it? I mean, in other words, what is the process there? First of all, do you, do you, you plan to reopen it, are you not? We do plan to reopen it, yes, okay, sir. Okay, and what is the process there? Uh, the process right now, I guess there's two major prongs to the process. One is we're undertaking a, a, a massive assessment ourselves of not only the Fort Washington plant, but all the other plants in our OTC network in North America. And the second is we have brought in this third party um, expert who has a lot of pharmaceutical experience to help independently tell us what we should do. Our plan is to combine those two assessments and discuss the master plan for remediation with the FDA by July 15th. Um, and just the last thing, when you all were meeting and firing these people, making the decision to fire them, I, I take it that this was embarrassing. This is an embarrassing episode to you all, is it not? The entire episode is extremely embarrassing to Johnson & Johnson. We take our commitment to our consumers on quality and safety very seriously. And of the people of Johnson & Johnson and McNeil are deeply troubled by what we, what's found, and we are all committed, deeply committed to remediating it. Well, I look forward to seeing the results of your efforts to remediate. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman uh, from Maryland for uh, his questions. Um, 
Mr. Goggin and let me say FDA, what we've heard today is not too reassuring or comforting. The initial story was bad enough. On April the 30th, Johnson & Johnson announced the largest recall of children's medicine in history. But it turns out there wasn't just one recall. What we've heard about today is rolling recalls, a phantom recall, a plant shutdown, and management firing. I think there are still unanswered questions. J&J &J told the committee staff that this most recent recall involved only six million bottles. That's what they told staff. That's a huge number. But today we learned from the FDA that it was almost 20 times that, namely 136 million bottles. J&J &J testified that there was no attempt to hide anything but we uncovered a J&J &J document showing that they told their contractors not to say this is a recall, just buy up everything. J&J &J says that none of its contaminated products has had any adverse health effects. But the FDA testified today that the issue of whether any of these products cause deaths is still being investigated. This is an issue of trust. When parents and grandparents give these medicines to their children, <coughs> they want to be confident that they are not harmful. Johnson & Johnson has a duty to ensure their safety and the FDA has a duty to enforce that duty. One thing we know now is that the FDA needs mandatory recall authority. They should not have to persuade a company to recall suspect products. I intend to introduce legislation, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Ranking Member, and uh, to give FDA that authority, and I hope you'll join me. FDA should also have the power to order a halt in drug production. At this point, there are still many unanswered questions. We intend to look further not sure we have we hold the record open to get additional information and to have some of the questions that we raise answered and then based on that we'll make a decision as to what we will do from this point on on that note i yield to the ranking member yes thank me chairman I, w I won't have a closing statement i would just join with you in uh, offering to work on bipartisan legislation to provide fda additional tools including uh, mandatory uh, recall capability. Yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, his uh, statement and his willingness to work along with me. On that note, the committee now is adjourned. Thank you, Jack. Definitely, man. You too.